Good Sunday morning to Souls Harbor. How are you? I pray that you've woke up well. I pray, as we always say, I pray you have enjoy. You are enjoying being blessed and loved by an awesome God. Awesome is who our God is, and we should praise him. He's worthy of our praise for being that kind of awesome. Uh, as we always say, and some of you are already on top of it, thank you for that. Uh, text me or give me the YouTube thumbs up. Let me know. Uh, that technology is good on your end. We're using different technology right now. So uh, if you don't care, uh, be a good sport. Let me know that technology is good on your end. I do apologize. I'm a couple of minutes late. Um, but hey, we ain't Baptist for nothing. That's just the truth. That's just the truth. Uh, so give me the YouTube thumbs up or text me and let me know that technology is good on your end. Uh, we're looking forward to getting into the Word of God with you today. Uh, amen. Thank y'all, good fellas, for sending me a message. Appreciate you so much. Um, we have uh, we have much to be in prayer about, much to be in prayer for. Um, but here's the truth: I, I pray and I hope that we don't get so caught up in our problems and in our needs. Uh, that we forget how much we have to praise God for. Amen. That's right. That's right. We, we should be a crazy about praisey people. Crazy, praisey. That's right. Um, uh, from a personal standpoint, uh, I want to thank you all for praying for um, Faith's family. Uh, there's been quite a few positive cases in her family. Uh, thank you for praying for uh, Karen. Karen wanted me to thank you all for praying for her. She's getting stronger every day. Uh, so uh, keep praying. But she wanted to thank you much for your prayers and for your kindness. Um, keep praying, if you will, for uh, Karen's sister, Faye. Uh, she's in the hospital with pneumonia on top of this COVID. Uh, so pray much for her. Her and her husband still in the hospital pray much for them. Uh, we need to be much in prayer. We, we've got folks in the church quarantined. Uh, we've got uh, sickness in our church. Uh, we need to be much in prayer one for another, be checking one on another, uh, be supporting, be praying, be loving, be cherishing, be appreciating one another. Uh, Thanksgiving is just a couple of days away. And we have folks that are so focused on the meal and we've got folks that are just all kinds of upset because the government is recommending that your Thanksgiving and my Thanksgiving be changed. Some folks aren't going to have it period because of this sickness. And uh, some folks just all kinds of tore up about that. But I, I do believe this and I believe that you do as well. Um, Thanksgiving is one of those holidays that means absolutely nothing if you're not living in it all year. If you're not thankful, if you're not appreciating your blessings, if you're not appreciating your blesser every day, then you taking one day out of the year to be thankful means absolutely nothing. You should be thankful. We should be thankful. Thankful people, air day, air day, E-R apostrophe, air day. Uh, same as Easter. Celebrate a risen Savior. Every day, same as Christmas, celebrate the birth, the, the beginning of victory. We should. Uh, sorry, I got off on a preach right there. Uh, we'd be much in prayer. Um, we've, we've got folks in the church that are battling injury. Um, just be much in prayer one for another. Still be much in prayer for Mr. Spencer and Miss Holly. We need to be much in prayer uh, for uh, Brother Gavin, Miss Haley, Baby Oakley, she she has not delivered yet. Um, they gave her a shot to slow down her her labor. I'm supposed to go back to Indy Tuesday. Uh, Brother John, Miss Karen, Gavin, Haley, if anybody's watching, if I've messed any of that up, let me know, and I, I want to correct that. So text me real quick. Let me know I'm on the right page or something. Uh, but we need to be much in prayer for them. Hudson still has not got back his test results to the best of my knowledge, but we need to be much in prayer for baby Hudson. Um, he's God's man already. Sure is. 
So we need to be much in prayer for him. Um, need to be much in prayer for our country, for our leaders. Um, uh, we, we, we need to bow the head and bend the knee, repent of our sins, turn from our wicked ways that God could heal our land and save our people. Uh, I'm desiring the day that we get together back in God's house together. That's my heart's desire as it is yours. But more than that is the safety of our congregation. Uh, come back tonight. My goodness, going to have a special, special singer help. Lord, the best I know. Looking forward to that tonight. Hey, Amen. I wonder who it is. Anyway, um, if you've got any prayer requests, also still remember Brother Randy Lunsford's sister. Um, continue to pray for her. She battles diabetes. Uh, be much in prayer for her. Um, just so, so many. So, so many. We need to be in prayer for. All right. Hey, Souls Harbor, I'm going to ask you if you don't care. I, I, I don't know what you're doing at home. Uh, well, Chase, we're staring at you. Ain't you blessed? I'm kidding. God help me on a 50 flat inch screen TV. God have mercy on your eyes. Um, Souls Harbor, can we pray together? Can we pray together? Let's just go ahead. Souls Harbor, all the churches that are gathered with us today, let's pray together. God, we look to you, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for being so great. We thank you for being our help. We thank you for being our stronghold, our mighty tower. Father, thank you for being our anchor. Lord, thank you for being our calm in the storm. Thank you for being our shelter. Thank you for being our blesser. Jesus, you're our help and you're our strength. God, there's no one like you. And I praise you forever just for being you. God, I thank you, Lord, that we have a way to get the gospel out. Lord, we have a way, Lord, somehow for the church family to be gathered together in spirit. Father, it's nothing like being in the building, but this is what we've got. And we thank you for this stage. God, how we come to you with so many prayers and so many burdens. Father, we pray, God, for Gavin and Haley and baby Oakley. Please, Lord, keep your hand on those blessings. Jesus, I pray, help them. Lord, we pray, God, for Holly and Holly Dartery and Brother Spencer. We pray for baby Jillian and their family. Father, we pray for our church. We've got sick in our church. Jesus, please heal. Please heal. Please help. Father, there are families, Lord Jesus, that death has come. Father, we pray the comforter. Father, we pray for Seth York's family. God, would you help Maddie and the kids? Father, would you help Paige? Lord Jesus, I, I pray there's things that we don't understand, but God, we still believe you're good. Father, we've got folks in the church that are injured. God, please recover. Please help, Lord Jesus, I pray. Please, God, take care of our blessings. Father, we pray, Lord, for Faith's family as they recover. Jesus, please help. Please help. Father, we pray for my family. God, please help them. Please help them. God, but today, would you bless your church wherever and however they're represented, whether it be in unity in, in a, in a God-fearing church house or, Father, whether it be in virtual, Father, whether it be in a parking lot service, whether, I, I don't know, God, you, you are limitless. You are a limitless God, but bless your people today. Father, help souls be saved, lives be changed, people be encouraged. Father, we're sorry for our sins. God, we get so caught up in prayer time, Lord, of praising, and we get caught up in praying and needing. God, don't let us forget that we need to say sorry. We need to apologize for our sins. We need to repent. God, we're, we're wrong, Lord, in our mindset at times. We're wrong, God, in our actions. We're wrong, Father, in how we treat others. We're wrong in how we treat you at times. God, we're sorry. Help me be a help to your people today. That's my prayer. I want to be. Lord, fill every word with your Holy Spirit power. I trust you, Lord. I need you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, we we have scriptures to turn today. Uh, if there's one thing that uh, I question about YouTube, I've got to put the title on. Uh, before I start the video, so you can already see kind of where we're going. I need you to do me a favor, though, before we get started, if you don't care. Um, don't judge the book by its cover. We're going to go in some familiar scriptures today. 
Um, but I, I want you to keep an open mind, if you will. Uh, want to deal deep, want to deal uh, with a serious text, if we will. Uh, today, I uh, want to challenge the Christian. Uh, the word of God is meant to challenge. It's meant to encourage. Let the word of God be the word of God today. If you got your Bibles, let's look this morning. Mine is closed. So we are more willing and ready. We are more than willing and ready to turn pages. If you got your phone, cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater, but you can still do it. Let's look uh, in the book of uh, First Timothy first. Amen. Easy for me to say. First Timothy. If you got your Bible at home. Keep your Bible open. We're going to turn some pages. Um, I hope you enjoy turning pages in your Bible. Helps us study together. How about that? We get to church together. We get to worship together. Now we're getting to study our Bibles together. Boy, oh boy. Uh, we, just keep, we just keep getting more blessed. Uh, First Timothy. Um, I, I would like to say something before we, we get into Scripture. Uh, if I could give you a thought, give you a title, I, I want to stand, teach, preach on this title. Your family knows if you're qualified. Um, now, listen, when, when you hear that title, when you read it on your screen, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind, because we are blessed Baptist, and sometimes we stick more on the bad news. We stick or we focus more on the drama um, is qualifications of ministers. And we, we think about pulling papers. Um, but here's, here's, I, I want you to look deeper than that. Uh, if you will, I, I want you to look at, at your qualifications as a Christian. Um, I, I'm an ordained minister, been ordained since 2012, 2013, one or the other. I've got a piece of paper that's got my name and good godly men's names on it. Uh, but let's, let's use our imagination for just a moment, if you will. Imagination time. Um, if you had an ordain, or, ordination certificate as a Christian, if you had an ordination certificate for your ministry, whatever it is, and every one of us is in a ministry, whether it's just whether it's the ministry of preaching, the ministry of teaching, of singing, uh, of ministering, um, or just the, the ministry itself, the work itself of being a Christian, and, and that entails so much encouraging and, and and exhorting and forgiving and all these things, Christian love, Christian kindness. If you had an ordination certificate for being a Christian, would you be worthy of your papers or do you deserve to have your papers taken? Now you can see where we're going. Praise God for that. Amen. First Timothy chapter number three, we want to take a look today. Uh, and I, I want to remind you, First Timothy chapter three is where we're at. Uh, it's where we're going to kick off at. Um, but I, I want to remind you of something. Family is more than blood. Family are those that are closest to you. So I want to remind you one more time, your family knows if you're qualified. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 3, if you have your Bible, uh, I'd only like to read uh, just one, uh, two verses to you if we could. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says this, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And obviously this is looking at pastors. Uh, and I, I understand that. But again, I, I want to look at all of us. I want to look at preachers. I want to look at teachers. I want to look at evangelists. I want to look at, I want to look at spouses. I, I want to look at kids. I want to look at, at Christians. Um, but your ministry, let's talk about your ministry first, because obviously this is where we're at in scripture. First Timothy three is going over the, the ministry of pastorship. Um, your family 
knows if you're qualified. Now, when I say qualified, I'm not just talking about whether you have the right to do what you're doing because of your stance or because of uh, what you've done wrong, but your family, they know if you're living your ministry or if it's just a performance. Amen. That's right. Your family, just, just to put it in truth, and remember, I'm talking to all of us, and I know I'm, I'm detailing that because I, I don't want you to sit back and say, get them, Chase, get them, Chase, and, and point at preachers or point at whoever you want to. I want you and I want me, and trust me, it's, it's already plowed my row. I want us to open our hearts to the word of God that God could help us. Don't sit on the bleachers, get in the game. Um. Your, to, to put this in, in, in just layman's terms, your family knows if you're living what you're preaching or if you're just noise and racket. Your family knows if the Christian life you expect others to live is what you're living or if it's just noise and racket. That's the truth. So let's look at your ministry, no matter what it is, uh, if it's preaching, if it's teaching, if it's if it's singing, if it's being a help, whatever you feel, if it's reaching out and praying with people, if it's reaching out uh, and encouraging people, you know the ministry that you feel God has put you in. Now, I want to look first, if we can, at dedication. Your family your family, those closest to you. And absolutely, we can look at that as work colleagues. We can look at that as schoolmates. We can look at that as your best friends. We can look at that as your friends. Whoever is closest to you, they know how dedicated you are to your ministry. They know how faithful you are. This is what I've always said concerning preachers. Um, if I could say it this way, uh, my preacher buddies, they, they don't know. They, they, they don't know how qualified I am. They don't know how much I live what I preach. They don't know how faithful I am to study God's word. They don't know how faithful I am to pray. They don't know how faithful I am to, uh, as First Peter said, to have holy conversation. They don't know how faithful I am behind closed doors to be thankful. They don't know how I treat my family. They're guessing. It's a guesstimation, if you'll have it that way. The church, Souls Harbor, where I pastor, I pastor you. Thank you for letting me serve. You don't know. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, I've always been a fan of behind the scenes, uh, behind the scenes of movies, behind the scenes of events. It, it's always just uh, excited my mind, excited my imagination. But this is what I've always said. Your family knows if you're qualified. You could have the amen of the entire church. You can have the amen of the entire, every place you go to preach, every place you go to minister, you can have the amen of everybody. But here's the truth. If your family, and I'm not talking about the family that's wrong, I'm talking about the family that's right with God. If your family knows that what they're seeing is not true, there is a problem. There is a problem. And, and, and that's for preachers. Now, I'm, I'm back to talking to all of us. Your family knows how dedicated you are. That's your first amen corner. Before God created, uh, and, and listen, you could have wool over everybody's eyes. You could have the wool over your work people's eyes that man alive, you're dedicated to what God's called you to do, no matter what it is again. You're, 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 you could have the wool over your schoolmates. You could have the wool over your friends. You could have the wool over your social media accounts. You could have the wool over everybody's eyes. But I promise you, your family knows, my friend, how dedicated you are to the work God's put you in. So there would have to be the question, of, and I know we're dealing with this more serious topic today. This is the message that God's put on our heart. I feel that of a certain. 
the, the question would have to be, we, we talk a lot as, as Christian Baptists, Baptist Christians, of who you have confidence in and who you don't have confidence in. Well, I don't have confidence in that group of singers, and I don't have confidence in that Christian. I wouldn't ask so-and-so to pray for me. I wouldn't listen to so-and-so preach. Here's a challenge for you. Look to your wife. Look to your husband. And ask them, honey, do you have confidence in me as a Christian? And don't ask in a defensive manner. Don't ask in a manner looking to get praise. Don't be ready to jump and fly off the fence mad. But I, I'm talking about your spouses, right with God. Your, I'm not talking about people that are uh, mad against God. I'm not talking about, because here's the facts. If folks are willing to be dishonest with God, they'll be dishonest with you. That's the truth. So look at your spouse that's right with God. Look at your kids that are right with God. Look at your siblings. Look at your parents. Whatever the case is, then ask them as a Christian, because before you can be a minister, you got to be a Christian. Before Whatever the case is, saved first. And here's the facts. Just because you saved doesn't mean you're Christian. Just because you saved going to heaven doesn't mean you're living heavenly. Ask your family, do you have confidence in me as a Christian? Let's, let's continue in this dedication way if we can. Your family, and, and, and here's the thing, no matter what ministry you're in, there are some things that are essential to every ministry because every ministry no matter how many branches it has, every ministry is a branch off one tree, the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. No ministry, whether it's feeding the poor, whether it's being encouragement to the discouraged, whether it's checking on people, whether it's singing, whether it's preaching, evangelizing, exhorting, and listen, Teaching, teaching classes you can feel is your ministry. If that's the field God's put you in, your job can be your ministry. But it's still a branch off the tree of life. So there are things that are essential because we're off that tree. So without Jesus, no matter what your ministry is, your ministry does not prosper how God wants it to if you remove yourself from Christ. Bible study is essential for every ministry. Every ministry. It's essential for why we believe what we believe. Absolutely it is. It's essential to be able to help people because it's the word of God. It's Jesus Christ in the volume of the book. Absolutely it is. But here's the truth. Your ministry is the work God has blessed you to do to make an impact, make an impression, make a change in people's lives, a positive change. And there's no positive change without the Christ. There's no impact without the great I am. So it's impossible. It's impossible to make this impact for Christ without Christ's word. If Christ is not making an impact in you, if he's not daily changing your life, if you are not allowing him to be God through his word in your life on a daily basis, you are daily hindering the work that God has called you to do. Can you say amen? That's right. That's right. Your family, they know if you study your Bible. They know how much you let God's word change you. Well, Chase, I study on my own. I'm never around my family when I study. That, that's me and God time. Why are you insecure? Why are you insecure about your time with God? Why, why wouldn't you study your Bible? And I, I understand that that's necessary. Trust me, I do the same thing. I study my Bible up here in this room on a faithful basis. But don't doubt it a bit. I, I, I'm more than fine studying God's word in front of my wife and family. My friend, 
And here's the truth. If your family, and this is not from the hip, this is from the throne. If your family is faithful to catch you on your phone, if your family is faithful to catch you on Facebook, if your family is faithful to catch you on the internet, if your family is faithful to catch you in the tree stand or out hunting, if your family is faithful to catch you at work, if they're faithful to find you in the weight room, if they're faithful to find you in all the activities and all the doings of life, my friend, there's only so many hours in the day. The truth is you're not studying. You're not letting God's word change you. So when you go acting and portraying this work that God caused you to do, has called you to do, and you got no Bible bullets in your gun, your family, my friend, has called your bluff. They know your study. They know your study life. So is your family, when they look at your Bible study life and how much you're letting God's word change you and how much God's word is your vocabulary, are they saying amen to your study life or are they saying, "Uh uh-oh? Not just the study of the Bible, the study of the ministry you're in. And I need to move quicker than I'm moving, but I feel like God's helping us plow some deep ground. You, now let me start off with this, with me. I am not the best at pastoring. I'm not the best at evangelizing. I am not the best. And that I promise I'm not taking glory in that by any means. Here's what I'm telling you. You're not the best. I love you, and I know that stings a little, but you're not the best. So the, and it doesn't matter what ministry you're in. If you're a a, a preacher, you're not, you are not the best. You have not arrived. You did not write the Bible. Your name is not Apostle Paul. And even if it was, you're not him. Even if you're a prayer warrior, even if your name's Hannah, you ain't the one. Even if you're a singer, you didn't write the book of Psalms. You have not arrived. The only way, if it's a school teacher, if it's a nurse, whatever your whatever your occupation is, because here's the truth, no matter what your occupation is, if you're letting God use it, it can be your ministry field. Can you say amen there? You're not the best. So as as discouraging as that sounds, the only way that the best become or have became the best is surrounding themselves with the best, being interested in the best and following after the best. So here's my question. Your family knows your study life as it is to study to become that. So for a preacher Your family knows how much you listen to good preaching. And I I know that we're living in a time that folks are, you know, are against some things, against studies if it's not in the Bible. And listen, I'm not the most, I'm not the most notable reader. I'm not, I've got a few books that I like to read. Your, Your family knows how much you look into other ministers' readings if you're a preacher. Your, your family knows how much you listen to preaching. Your family knows how much you talk to good preachers. Your family knows these things. And listen, if you're a minister's wife, you are not the best. If you're a deacon's wife, you are not the best. The only way to become that is to surround yourself with the best. Every, every Timothy has a Paul and that's gender neutral because I feel in my soul, Chase Lay as a Timothy ought to have apostle Paul's that he looks up to pastor Bob Bogues, one of them. He's a hero to all of us. I've got, I've got men that are pastors to me. I'm more than fine running them off for you. Pastor Bob Bogue, pastor Tim Jones, pastor Doug Newberry, pastor Kevin Benny, Pastor Cody Dykes, Pastor Scott Harper, uh, I believe that is my list. Pastor Bobby Dale Jewell, Pastor Johnny Zachary, Pastor Ben Lay, Pastor Greg Overton. There's my list. 
Those men are not just pastors to me. Pastor Eugene Bird. Uh, those men are not just pastors to me, but they're pastors to my wife. And, and I'm more than happy to say this to you. I can flip that for my wife. And I'm getting stuck here. Y'all need to pray. Just touch harder. I'm getting stuck. I can flip that for my wife. And I can say that Nana Bogue is a pastor to her. Take that term loosely. I know. Don't don't Baptist freak out on me. But I, I, Pastor or Miss Nana Bogue is a what you would call a pastor to my wife. Kim Jones, Debbie Harper, Geraldine Bird, uh, Elisa Jewell, uh, Kim Jones, uh, Miss Sherry Newberry, uh, Aunt Karen Lay, and, and the list goes on. My friend, listen to me. The same as if you're a teacher. I'm talking Sunday school teacher. I'm talking teacher. My friend, listen to me. The only way to become great is to surround yourself with great teaching. Are you listening to preaching? Are you listening to teaching? Are you surrounding yourself with the ministry you're in? And, and, and here's the truth. The Christian life is a ministry. So here's the truth. The only way to become a great Christian, only way to become a great Christian, my beloved friend, obviously, surround yourself with Christ. We're teaching Thursday nights on having a Jesus-centered, Holy Ghost-filled life. But I want to promise you, your Christian life will fail if you surround yourself with hypocrites, you surround yourself with bitterness, you surround yourself with anger, you surround yourself with gossipers, you surround yourself with drama addicts, you surround yourself with people that refuse to do anything else but throw a pity party. You want to be a successful Christian, surround yourself with successful Christians. Can you say amen? That's right. That's right. And that's that's neutral for all of us. The study of becoming a successful, great Christian, and I mean great because none of us will be perfect until we get to heaven. So if you ever feel like you've arrived, let the reins of your brains know you've got a long way to go. The dedication... How much are you studying your Bible? I'm talking to all Christians. How much are you studying your Bible? How much are you listening to Jesus' music? How much are you talking to great Christians? How much are you talking to heroes of faith? How much time are you spending, my friend, uh, surrounding yourself with Christian influences? How much preaching are you listening to? How much singing are you listening to? How much teaching are you listening to? How much are you talking with your family about the Christian ministry, the Christian work? How much are you talking about the church business that's going on? How much are you talking about what you want to see at the church? How much are you, how much time are you spending in prayer? The study and the dedication of the Christian life. Your family knows it. And if it's your job, your occupation, if if it's no matter what it is, I'm not going to run through the list again. You can't be great at it unless you surround yourself with greatness. Hey, real quick, I feel like I'm losing you. You got my phone number, anything like that. If I'm running, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm on the right page, somebody say amen somewhere. Bless your heart. Amen and amen. Praise God forever. Amen. Let's, let's look on, if we will. Um, I, we've looked and, and we've wore out dedication. Let me say this just for a moment. Your family knows how faithful you are to this dedication as well. Very easy, whether it's whether it's song lead, whether it's whether it's preaching, whether it's teaching, whether it's exhorting, encouraging, whatever the case is, you know your ministry, but your family knows, friend, if you're on a couple weeks and off a few months. Your family knows if you're on today, off tomorrow. Has your family, have they come to count on your unfaithfulness? Or have they come to trust your faithfulness? Here's the truth. There are families that know God is real. They know it because there's somebody in their house, somebody in their family that lives the life that makes you think they got Jesus on speed dial and Jesus has them on speed dial. Mm -mm -mm. There's no doubt. 
about who God is because there's family in their family. Boy, that makes you know. Hey, what some of these other jokers got probably ain't the real thing, but what that family member out there has got, good God in heaven, I want it. It's Jesus. Let's move on. I'm getting stuck. Anyway. Thank you. Your family knows, and I might wind up, I don't know, pray hard. I, I need to get through some of this. Your family knows the passion that you have for your ministry. Your family knows the passion that you have for your ministry. The love you have for it. The, and, and, and that's the best word I can use. Your family knows the love you have for the job, for the work, for the life God's gave you to live. I'm going to hit some of these quick because I've got bigger stuff to get to. If I sat down with your family and I looked at them and I was talking to them about you and I asked them, what's some things that you daddy? What's some things that you mom? What's some things that your son? What's some things your daughter? Your grand? You know who you is. What What do they love? Would the work and the life God's gave you to live, would they even mention it? Would it be first? If it's preaching and I sat down with your family and I said, does he, does he love being a minister? I sat down with your wife, sir, and I said, do you love being involved? Do you love being in the ministry? Do you love the fact that the ministry is your life? If it's singing, and I, I asked your spouse, I asked your kids, do they love do they love singing for Christ? I mean, how much passion can can and and, and I used to think this was just emotional hogwash, but I've seen it to be the truth. There's people that love so much what they do. You can see it in their eyes. You can hear it in their voice. The passion, the energy for what God's gave them to do is all about them. Is that your case? Would your family say that what God's gave you to do, whether it's the, hey, listen, don't, don't go, don't go too far. Just the Christian life, living like a Christian, living as God's man, God's woman. If I asked your family, do they love, do you love, do, do, do they love living a Christian life? Would they look at me and say, absolutely, they love it? Or would they just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's what they do. Let's move on. Your family knows your passion for your ministry. Hey, here, here's, here's, here's something for you. Your family knows if you're getting bored. I'm not just talking about watching a YouTube video. I'm talking about your family knows if you're getting bored doing what God's called you to do. Your family knows... If you're getting bored living the Christian life, your family knows if you're getting bored praising God, you're getting bored living for God, you're getting bored serving him, you're getting bored preaching for him, you're getting bored teaching, you're, you're getting bored in the work God's put you in in life. Your family knows if you're getting bored. My chase, that's no big deal. All right, let's look at it. Let's, let's, let's take the Christian life. You're getting bored. Living a life, breathing air that the King of Kings, Lord of Lords gave you. You're getting bored, surrounded by blessings that God himself picked out for you. The creator of everything picked out for you. You're getting bored. 
Hey, by the time I get done with this list, you're going to feel real, real small. I don't know. This might be one of those messages we all don't leave happy. Be all right, though. Come back tonight. Live at five. Your family knows if you're getting bored living with the kingdom of God, the kingdom living inside, you are getting bored living every day, being saved, not going to a burning hell. And for you are destined, man, to go to an eternal heaven. You're getting bored. Jeez, oh, Pete. I uh, chase when you put it like that. No, that is how it is. If you're preaching, you're getting bored. Being the hand that's reaching down to people in the ditch, reaching down to people in their struggle, reaching down to people in hell itself. On their way to hell, man. Pulling them out. If it's teaching, you're getting bored. You're getting bored making the little details in people's life so they can live a victorious life for Christ. You're getting bored. I know. Hey, I'm just going to put it blunt. Don't we feel like dummies that we're getting bored now? Getting bored. All right, let's move on. Lastly, concerning your ministry, and we'll move on because I, I, I need I, I need to move faster. Folks, I'm going to take us to that 60-minute mark. Just letting you know now. I, mean, I ain't going to get done. I just know I'm not, so I'm not going to try. Uh, but I, I, I want every word to have meaning. Your family knows how much joy you get out of the ministry you're in. They do. What means most to you is what you talk about, friend. Your your family knows how excited you are about the ministry you're in. Your family knows how happy you are in the ministry. My wife knows how happy I am to be pastor at Souls Harbor Baptist Church. She knows how happy I am to preach God's word. She knows how happy I am. And listen, this is all ministry. All ministry. She knows if I'm happy at the job I'm at. She knows if I'm happy working with behavioral students. She knows if I'm happy being a football coach. Well, Chase, that's all nuts. No, it's ministry. It's what God's put me in. My wife knows if I'm happy being her husband. Don't you doubt it one bit, folks. And I ain't blinking. I'm happy being my wife's husband. Don't you think that your family knows you good enough to be able to pick up when you ain't happy? Yeah. Yeah. Sir, your family knows if you're happy being a minister. Ma'am, your husband knows if you're happy being a minister's wife. Sir, your wife knows if you're happy being a deacon. Ma'am, your husband knows if you're happy being a deacon's wife. Listen, friend, your family knows if you're excited about the work God's put you in. I'm not talking about getting up every Monday morning at the crack of dawn, jumping out of your bed. Yippee, I get to go to work because the case of the Monday is real, folks. But there should still be happiness. There should still be joy out of living the life that God's chosen for you. Are you still happy? Are you still joyful? Rob Bogue, Holly Lunsford, Courtney Golden. Are you, are you still happy singing for us on Sundays? Are you still happy being a blessing to us? Musicians, are you still happy? making a joyful noise, praising him with stringed instruments and wailing with drums. Our Sunday school teachers, are you still happy? Are you still excited about teaching our people and making a difference for the cause of Christ? Souls Harbor family, are you still happy 
Watch out, watch out. What we're going, what we're going to do if people ain't happy? If they ain't happy, they need to talk to God. God make them happy. God turn the frown upside down. There ain't nothing wrong with God. There's something wrong with the people. Discouragement can happen to all of us. It can, and it does. But it's our responsibility to go to God when those discouraging times happen that we can be encouraged. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, and we'll move on. The difference between power-filled saints and not are people that are happy to be power-filled saints. Amen. You still are you still happy? I guarantee you, if I asked Bob Bogue right now, are you still happy to be in the ministry? He'd say yes, sir. If I asked Miss Nina Bogue right now. Are you still happy, Miss Nina, that he's your Lord? <laughs> Boy, I'm about to tell you how that'll go. Glory to God. <laughs> Are you still excited about the Christian life? That there's an almighty God that loves you. There's amazing grace, or is it is it just good grace to you now? You know, it's just all right grace to you. Hey, I'll admit my my failure uh, in one point, if you don't care. There was a time, uh, preacher, pastors, whoever, look at me and Brother Chase come preach. I'd be about at a fast-paced jog, fast-paced walk, get to the pulpit. I need to get back to that. Anybody else need to get back to some excitement in your, in your Christian life? All right. Let's finish on a bad note. Amen. I got a lot more to go, but I got stuck. Turn in your Bibles. If you got your Bibles at home, the book of Ephesians, book of Ephesians. We're getting close to being done. Amen. I ain't going to take us over that 60 mark. You got my word. The book of Ephesians, if you got your Bibles, let's go there, please. We've got... Uh, two more places to read. Ephesians 6, if you have your Bible at home, verse 4. Ephesians 6 and verse 4. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Look with us in the book of Proverbs, if you have your Bible, book of Proverbs, chapter 17. Keep turning, I'm turning too. Keep turning. Book of Proverbs, chapter number 17. We've got just a little bit of reading to do. So please follow along with us if you don't care. Book of Proverbs chapter 17, verse number one. Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. A wise servant shall have rule over a son that causes shame and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. The finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. A wicked doer giveth heed and to false lips, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker, and he that is glad at calamities shall not be unpunished. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Excellent speech becometh not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. A gift is precious. Now, Underline, highlight this verse. We're going to come back to it if we get time. If we don't, we won't, but keep with the verse. A gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it, whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that reapeth a matter separateth very friends. A reproof endureth more into, into a wise man than an hundred stripes into a fool. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger 
shall be sent against him. Let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it meddled with. He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abominations to the Lord. Wherefore, is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? A friend loveth at all, I love this verse, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A man void of understanding striketh hands, and becoming surety in the presence of his friend. He loveth transgression that loveth strife, and he that exalteth his gates seeketh destruction. He that hath a froward heart findeth no good, and he that hath perverse tongue faileth, he falleth into mischief. That's reading uh, book of Proverbs 17 1 through 20. Uh, I want to say this, and we're looking at just a, a, a new point just for the last few minutes, if you don't care. Um, your family knows if you're qualified concerning forgiveness. I'm going to take eight minutes and I'm going to run real hard right here. Concerning forgiveness. Here's the truth about it. Your family, those closest to you, they know how qualified you are, how much you live forgiveness. They know how much you live apologies over your wrong. They know how much you live concerning forgiving others of their wrong. They know how much you live moving on, letting go of other people's wrongs that they've caused to you, and they know how much you live and let go of your wrong after you sought forgiveness. That's right. Your family knows how qualified you are concerning forgiveness. I, I want to just hit something real hard, just real quick truth point. The more you live in anger, the more you live in bitterness, the more you live in hatred, the more you live in negativity, the more you encourage your family to do the same. Here's a question for you. If your family had the same attitude toward forgiveness, toward saying, I'm sorry, toward accepting apologies toward apologizing, toward forgiving, toward moving on that you do. Would you be happy or would you be disappointed with your family? Anybody out there? There's nothing worse in some ways. And I'm talking about a good family, a family that loves God, a family that's good, pure, loving and kind. There's nothing worse than their disappointment and their embarrassment. I told you we're going to sink the blade real deep right here. You look at your family and you say, I'm sorry for some wrong you've done. If they just shrug their shoulders, their shoulders and go on because they know what you've apologized for. You will continue to do your apology means nothing. You're not qualified in forgiveness. You're disqualified. Amen. Your family looks at you and they apologize to you for whatever wrong that they've done. They apologize out of the goodness of their hearts. But they know that you're not going to let it go and you will bring it up the next time you do a wrong. You're not qualified. If, if you do a wrong, and, and look, this is not just to your attack. This is to your healing. If you do a wrong, 
my friend, listen to me. You, you've sought out forgiveness and you are living to erase that bad with good. My friend, you are doing what you need to do. And that may take weeks. That may take months. Depends on what the bad is. Depends on how much bad there is. But my friend, if your blessings mean anything to you, if your family means anything to you, you'll live as long as you need to live erasing that bad. Are you more tempted to just give up and quit erasing? Or does your blessings mean that much to you that you're going to keep on erasing until that bad's no longer there? A friend of mine, <clears throat> me and a preacher friend of mine were talking about forgiveness uh, one time. And I love this quote. If you're taking notes, you ought to write this down. If not, you ought to keep it hard. A friend of mine were talking about forgiveness one time. And he, he said that he asked someone, when should a person truly be forgiven. And it, the, the context was when should a church forgive a person that's wrong them? Should restore. I'll put it that way. Should restore. And this is what was said. When the desire to erase the wrong is more obvious than the wrong itself. How qualified are you? How qualified are you in forgiveness? Or do you need to turn your papers in? How qualified are you as far as your own wrongs? How much does your family know that when you hurt their feelings, when you say things wrong, when you do things wrong, when when you lash out in anger, when whatever your case is, I don't know you. How much can they trust that you're going to apologize and live to make it right? We, we talk and we focus so much in our churches about, you know, children honoring their parents and how the children should do this and the children should do that. And I agree with all that. It's biblical. But you and I would have to admit, my beloved friend, that we are bad. We are bad to pull out the scriptures that we want to pull out for the reasons that we want. I want to encourage parents. You are doing one of two things and we're, we'll be done. We'll be done. Hopefully we'll get to come back and finish up some other time. You're doing one of two things as parents. You are either showing your kiddos how to be or you're showing them how not to be. Well, Chase, at least God's getting glory out of my life somehow. That's the wrong attitude to have, my friend. It's the wrong attitude to have. If parents wrong kids, parents need to apologize and fix it. If kids wrong parents, it's needful that kids apologize and fix it. If siblings wrong siblings, it's needful that siblings apologize and fix it. If families, it, it doesn't matter if it's spouses that wrong spouses, there needs to be an apology. If you care, you will. If you don't, you won't. You're not apologizing to get forgiveness. You're apologizing because you're wrong. How qualified are you concerning forgiveness? <sighs> this is this is not one of those messages and I'm closing my my Bible is closed. I do apologize. 
this might not be one of those messages that we all just get up and shout a while. You know, um, and I, I know I'm over that hour, but I, I'm going to be right on top of it. Um, if someone's still qualified, the way they would go about getting their papers back if they've turned them in, would be to apologize to the church. Church would take a motion and second and a vote and give the person back their papers. That's how that would go. I mean, isn't it? Hey, a lot of y'all been in this church thing longer than I have. Is that not how it goes? The person still qualified. Some of y'all, some of us, I feel tears coming. It might be necessary because of how we've handled our Christian lives, how we've handled our lives, how we, and I know I focused 50 minutes on ministry, how we've handled the work that God's put us in, in front of our families. Might be necessary for us to look at our families and ask them to pray with us. Apologize to God. He's the one that gave it to you, gave you Christian life, gave you ministry. He's the one that forgave you, even if you don't forgive. And when you get done, look at your family. Apologize. Ask for your papers back. No, not physical papers. Ask for their confidence back. And don't just ask for it back. Promise to work for it. Get your excitement. Get your dedication. Get your passion. Get your forgiveness. There's a review. Your ministry and your master are worth it. Your blessings and your blessers worth it. Oh, anyway, hey, I'm looking forward to being back with you tonight. It'll be more positive. It'll be more positive. Not sure which way we'll go. We may finish off tonight or may finish off this morning's tonight. We've got some other things on our heart. We'll just wait and see. Um, Souls Harbor, I love you. Faith, if you're watching, I love you, dear. My family, I love you. And love has a desire to please the one it loves. Can I encourage you before we go, just in case there's anybody watching might need to do a little repentant party at your house. We get so caught up in our prayer time of praying and needing. We forget to repent. Saying I'm sorry. Apologizing. It won't happen in our physical lives if it doesn't happen to God. How can we appreciate forgiveness when we never seek it? All right, I'm done. I love you, church. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for sticking with me. I look forward to seeing you tonight at five o'clock. From this time until next time, bye.